as I say, I spent a lot of time on uh, rivers and streams of Belize. Uh, we've, been, we've been working on particularly trying to get community engagement in taking care of watersheds for the past, say, 30 years. And the last maybe year and a half, things have really been picking up. A lot more interest out there, and I'm, I'm sure the drought has had a lot to do with it. Uh, so there's a lot of people that are really interested in looking at our water system. So I, I want to talk a little bit about what farmers can do to get prepared for the uh, upcoming events that Five C's predicts for Belize, uh, particularly related to trees, because uh, trees and farming are oftentimes considered to be in opposition. So um, uh, let's see right here. So starting out, I know this is not going to be too readable, but I'll, I'll work through it uh, with you guys. So as I would mentioned, the five C's have a model that's been working in uh, Belmont Pond, and they've been processing a lot of data they fed into this model. And the prediction is ultimately that uh, Belize is going to become drier over time. We're going to be seeing an uh, increase in drought frequency, as we've seen this year. Um, we're going to probably have more punctuated rainfalls. And so that means potential for more flooding, um, more frequent hurricanes, increasing uh, flood potential, as I said, and eutrophication of rivers, like we saw with New River this year, which was something that caught us all by surprise. So we're just like every other species in the world. We have two choices. We can adapt or we can go extinct. And I think everybody here wants to take that first choice and I think we have the capacity to do that. We just need to get our heads around that and realize what has to happen. To survive, we have to be smart. We have to change our relationship with nature. And we have to work together, seriously work together. So those are the obstacles that we really have to get over. But I think that we have what it takes to move in that direction. There's a lot of things that farmers can do in the short term, and they've heard a lot about those, that, those uh, ideas, those farmers that have been here. There's a lot of things that can be done, um, including uh, starting to protect and uh, the soils, using uh, cover crops and those sorts of things, uh, effective microorganisms, biochar. We've been seeing all those uh, presentations that lay that information out for us. Uh, probably even moving to more climate, to uh, climate resilient crops, things like that. Uh, and of course, um, climate smart agriculture. So there's a lot of things in the toolkit here for farmers. Um, improving agricultural efficiency and productivity, uh, as opposed to clearing more land to grow crops uh, inefficiently. And stop the unnecessary deforestation. And that, of course, is in the best interest of farmers. If farmers realize that, they would definitely be on board. Because uh, I'll talk a little bit more about why that's important. But especially clearing steep slopes, and especially clearing riparian forest, and also um, damaging wetlands. And the next thing that not just farmers, but all of us can do is to reduce the pollutants that we dump into the environment. And a lot of those, a lot of those uh, pollutants, well, New River, for example, is, is a eutrophic system that's recovering now because of all the nitrogen that's fed into that system, not just from BSI, but from everybody in that system. And we spend a quarter of our paychecks making fecal material, and then we throw it away. That's pretty wasteful. That's the easiest thing to recycle, really. And we can do that on site, capture those nutrients, and do good things with it right there in our yard and our farms. Uh, but until we really get to the point where we look into that seriously, we're still going to have these pollution issues. Um, in the long term, and here I'm talking decades, we need to start reforesting. That's the, that's the big uh, challenge in front of us today. And as I get later into this, you'll see there's some opportunities coming our way to actually do just that. And of course, one of the advantages we have is we are a small country. We can make big impacts uh, that, that are very obvious to us in short periods of time compared to other places in the world. 
So just kind of starting out and putting farmers into focus. In reality, same thing that Chris was saying uh, earlier this morning, as it turns out, farmers are the reason civilization can exist. If it weren't for farmers out there growing food for the rest of us, we wouldn't have all the things that modern civilization has. We'd all be hunters and gatherers. We wouldn't have, um, we wouldn't have all these advanced infrastructure and universities and science and technology and global communication and literature and all these things that some of which we may not need. But without farmers feeding us, we wouldn't have time to do that. We would all be farmers. Um, but the problem is, no matter how good the soil is, no matter how high quality the seeds are, ultimately it all comes down to, no matter how much the farmer really knows, it all comes down to how much water is available, ultimately, that whether or not we have successful crops, as this year points out with uh, corn and everything else. So one thing that history teaches us is that having dependable water available or not is what causes civilizations to live or die. Civilizations crash when water's not there. And that's one of the theories for what happened to the ancient Maya. And of course, that, the, that particular issue is related to the potential deforestation of this area by the Maya that were here. We're doing the same thing. We're following into the same footsteps. What, what the history doesn't really teach us, what you really have to look into the ecology to understand is how important forests are to providing the quality and the quantity of water that we need. It's the forests that are the water makers. In Costa Rica, they have protected all of their mountain range. It runs through the center of the, of the country and they refer to that as their water factory because that's where the waters are collected and, and eventually feed into the rivers that provide for their, their people and industries and so forth. Trees are water pumps. They're pulling the water out of the ground. They're putting it back into the atmosphere. They're contributing to the local climatic patterns. The trees aren't there. That doesn't happen. Local climate is no longer uh, like it was. Um, the roots and, the, and the, the detritus and the soil and the associated microbes around every root are vital to determining the quality of water that filters through soil and ultimately into the rivers and streams. That's why when we strip out all of our riparian forest, the quality of our rivers begin to, to uh, degrade. So ultimately the message here is deforestation kills civilization. And we don't want to go down that route. We don't have to go down that route, hopefully. Hopefully we got time here. So a little bit about what's uh, going on in Belize deforestation-wise. When I first got to Belize in the 1980, um, we were looking at something roughly like 70% cover of, def of forest areas in the country. And uh, today it's down to about 58% roughly 40% of that being in protected areas, but that doesn't mean it's protected because even in the protected areas, forests are degrading. Um, another 18% of that is in private hands, and that's the forest that degrades the fastest because that's the forest that can be cleared for, like uh, the big patch of forest east of, of Belmopan. Uh, that's been cleared recently for sugarcane. So we're going to see sugarcane growing there at some point from Santander. So ultimately we're looking at roughly an 18% loss rate in 40 years, roughly 5% per 10 years. That's pretty, that's pretty startling. Um, and of course, uh, this is increasing. It's not slowing down, it's increasing. We're getting larger farms, we're getting uh, a lot of export we're getting corn, beans, rice, sugar, uh, replacing our, our uh, traditional exports of uh, bananas and citrus. And all of that's not being developed on old banana and citrus farms, it's being developed in new bush. So deforestation is, is on the rise, um, unfortunately. One I've got here that you're not gonna be able to appreciate, but I encourage you to do so on your own laptops is a Google Earth shot um, this would actually, if you could see it, it actually shows the Rio Hondo running through the, the center of the screen here and on either side, Mexico and Belize, 
And you can see essentially this is a river that is sitting in the middle of a, a pretty much agriculturally devastated landscape. But also what you would see if you could see it is there's forest patches left. There's um, potential for redeveloping the forest cover and doing so in a productive landscape where at the end of the run you can restore ecosystem services and you can enhance, not reduce, the productivity of the landscape. If you work hand in hand with the climate smart approach to agriculture and also taking care of the elements of the environment that are providing those vital ecological services that keep us all going, including, including farmers. Belize is on this side. All right, here we go. I just, I just wanted to flush this up about riparian forests, looking at it from the farmer's perspective, what the, what the real benefits are to the farmer, uh, and to all of us, really. Um, riparian forests, of course, are preventing bank failure if they're left intact, and that's sediments that otherwise make it all the way out to the, the marine environment and ultimately uh, humbugging those areas. But one very important thing is standing uh, riparian forests dissipate flood energy. If you see floods moving down a river uh, with riparian forest on either bank, you see a lot of turbidity along the edges, and those uh, bribri and other trees are swaying in that fast flowing water. They're dissipating that energy. They're reducing the energy of that moving water, which reduces its ability to damage the landscape. Strip those out and you've got much faster flowing water with a lot more destructive potential. And uh, we've seen examples of that uh, quite frequently in Belize. Um, it's also the filter system of the landscape. All this so-called non-point discharge, things that aren't coming out of a pipe but are, but are draining off the landscape. If they have to pass through this riparian forest, most of the pollutants are taken up and broken down before they actually reach the river. The sediments don't reach, the, the soils that are being eroded don't reach the river and, and wash down. They're maintained on the landscape. Um, they also harbor a lot of pollinators, which is very important for agriculture. And as far as the ecology of the river goes, the riparian forests are what really feed rivers and streams. Rivers and streams eat trees. They eat the leaves and limbs and fruits and flowers of the riparian forest that's falling into the river all the time. And that's the base of this detritus processing system. So when you strip out those riparian forests, you remove the shade, you remove the food source, you reduce the, 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 the uh, biodiversity of the organisms living there. So this is a, an example of the uh, Belize River Valley. And, and again, I encourage you to check this out on Google Earth. I like to use Google Earth rather than other sources of remote imagery because we all have access to that. We can all sit down and look at images that are less than two years old and see things relatively frequently. And it's the best source of information you can, you can access uh, in a moment's notice. But you can, you can see the, the amount of uh, deforestation all the way up to the edges of the river and pretty much throughout the, uh, the river valley. So there's a, a tremendous amount of, of agriculture happening here. Uh, even the, the uh, tributaries coming into the streams have been cleared almost completely. And so those are essentially nothing but drainage ditches now, feeding directly into the Belize River. And by the way, everybody here, no matter where you're coming from, out of Belize, whatever tourist that lands in Belize, we all drink from the Belize River. Every one of us. If you drink bottled water, if you drink Bellicans, if you drink Coca-Cola, you're drinking from the Belize River. So the Belize River is of national importance for water in Belize, not just for the 140 to 50,000 people that actually live there, but for all of us. This is kind of zeroing in on, on a, a meander of the river so that you can see the extent of deforestation that obviously is not so clear to you. But most of what you see that line the riverbanks are not trees, that's spiny bamboo. That's one of the things that can come back pretty readily and is the first successional plant in a recovery process 
but it's also tends to really challenge trees that are trying to go through that thick mat. But at least it's there to help fortify the riverbanks and allow some recovery. I was called in not long ago to um, work with uh, SWAG, the um, Southern uh, Watershed Alliance group that is wanting to create a management plan for the North uh, Stan Creek. And if you, could, uh, if you could see this map, what you would see is this river reach, instead of having corn and beans on all, this, on all sides of it, this is almost completely citrus. This is uh, one area where there's still lots of citrus development going on. And uh, this next shot, actually, you can't really see it either, but um, there's a, a little coded lines on here where the red lines represent where there are absolutely no riparian forests left. And then there are yellow lines that where, is where there's riparian forests left, but it's less than the 66 feet that we all think is a law, but it's not. It's a suggestion. And, and it doesn't have the power of a law or a regulation at this point. Uh, we were trying to weave that into the, the, integrated, water, the integrated Water Management Act the Integrated Water Resource Management Act. It took us 12 years to get that, that idea eventually converted to a law in 2013, but it was never enacted. So we still don't have an active act, and we still don't have an umbrella organization such as a Water Resource Management Authority to make these decisions, and so our, our um, our laws are still behind the times here. I was speaking with a, a young woman who's working at Red Plus from Guyana, and she was asking me, well, what are the issues? And I said, well, riparian deforestation is probably number one. And she couldn't understand that. She said, how could people do that? If you did that in Guyana, you would be arrested. You would be fined. There's, comp there's, there's prices to pay for doing something like that but not in Belize. So consequently, here we are. And what you see, if you could see this, you would see this, this edge of the outside bend of a river right here. This is uh, where the energy is the fastest. This, the, the water's coming around this curve and it's this outside bend where the water's moving and eroding. And water, when it's going around a corner, it's actually spiraling. So it's very erosive. And what you would see is citrus trees sitting right on the edge of the bank. And that's not the first row of citrus trees. The others have already since fallen in. This is being undercut. And, you know, there's, I know that they say common sense really isn't so common, but you would think that a farmer could look at the landscape and figure out that, well, this is not a good idea. We do need to back off and leave this, this citrus here. Um, this, is a, this is a slide here. You see some lines on it. Um, the inside lines here, this is the edge of the river. The inside lines represent the 66 foot um, suggested width of a riparian forest. That actually goes back to a law in the mid-1930s that was trying to guarantee campsite space and firewood access to people who are traveling on rivers. Uh, it's not really the best riparian um, um, law. And so here I've, I've, expend, I've extended it to 100 feet. So these outside lines are 100 feet. But if you, could, if you could actually see, this is all citrus here. If you could actually see the citrus that falls within this area here between the, the river and this part of the field is all very gnarly, reduced citrus. It's growing in pretty rich soils, but it has to suffer the impact of frequent floods, so it doesn't grow like regular citrus that's growing upslope. So what is the benefit to the farmer for trying to grow citrus in a riparian zone that's too high energy to really accommodate that citrus tree? So we all lose. 
The farmer loses the investment they put on the ground to put that, that uh, set of orchards there, and we as a society lose because we lose the protection of the riparian forest that would otherwise help keep our rivers clean. The other issue in agricultural environments are wetlands. And for all of us, and the farmers too, wetlands are very important because they absorb floodwaters. And they hold those floodwaters on the landscape long enough for water to percolate down and recharge the aquifers. And when we strip out those, uh, those wet wind, let wetlands, we lose that service. Um, they also store carbon, which of course is important. And also they harbor a lot of biodiversity. But from the practical point, they're very important for flood control. If it weren't for Crooked Tree, for example, Crooked Tree absorbs so much flood water that if that water were to go through Belize City on a regular basis, the low-lying areas of Belize City where people are living in semi-swamp conditions wouldn't exist. That would be uninhabitable. But Crooked Tree absorbs and slowly releases that water um, and it does so a lot less effectively now since the, uh, the minister decided to build a causeway across the western canal, or the western uh, lagoon, and block the western lagoon. It's like a dam. There's no flow through. So the, the, that part of the watershed, that part of the wetland can't absorb floodwaters anymore until it's high enough that it tops that, that uh, causeway. Um, and then that was built in 2009. I've been making the suggestion that we need to put some culverts in there for 10 years, and here we are 10 years later, and we're still talking about it. And this is, again, if you could see this, you would see some wetlands here. There's a horseshoe lake up in this corner, completely cleared. You can't grow crops in saturated soils. You can't grow corn in saturated soils. You can't grow citrus in saturated soils. But they clear anyway. And asking the farmer why, the answer is so that you don't have to turn the tractor. You can plow in a straight line. And you see over here, there's another wetland where there's actually been a canal dug to drain the wetland so that they can possibly claim that land for agriculture. But even still, the wetland is there for a reason. That's where the low part of the landscape is. That's where the water pools and the plants that lived there were the plants that were adapted to that. And the farmer took those out, hoping that they're going to be able to expand the field. But that just doesn't work. This last shot shows a, a wetland sitting in, in the middle of a field that has been plowed through on one side and has crops going all the way up to the saturated soil on the other side. But again, the wetland has been pretty well denuded, and none of that's left anymore. So New River, that was a wake-up call. Ah, water, I can't go a day without this stuff. I'm addicted. But New River's a wake-up call. One thing that it taught us is that we're not prepared. The DOE, I was part of this task force to help try to struggle with this event. The DOE was taught, caught completely off guard and we didn't really have the tools to go in and address the issue. Uh, they did the best they could under the circumstances. We pulled out what we could, what was available to us to try to do a little bit of alleviation, but that's about all we could do. And New River became, of course, as you all know, eutrophic and it had a lot of hydrogen sulfide gases coming off of it because it was anaerobic. Fish kills by literally the truckloads. Even crocodiles turn belly up in, in New River. And the news is, it's going to happen again. New River is sitting, it is a wetland river. It's sitting in a fault line. It's a low, it doesn't have very much elevation to begin with. So it's a very slow moving river and it's highly susceptible to uh, eutrophic events. As a matter of fact, when, the, when the, the rainfalls weren't there to push the water out, the river started flowing backwards because the, the tidal, the saltwater wedge would rise up the river and push the water back upstream. 
And all that oily film that, that you saw on the surface of the water, that was all these um, waxes and oils from the, from the anaerobic breakdown of plant material. This system is already, it's in a wetland, it's already loaded with organic material. And then of course BSI has traditionally used the river as a disposal system. But over the years, they have made improvements. Their big issue right now is cooling water that's not cooled down enough before it's discharged into the river. That's the big issue they've got to get their heads around. And they're investing a chunk of money to put in cooling towers and that sort of thing, especially after this year. They don't want to repeat that kind of, uh, of uh, public scenario in the future. So they are investing. They are trying to, uh, to do something. And so the, the, first, the first thing we did as a, as a team was to go to Orange Walk and address the people and try to talk with the people about what the issue was about. And we encountered a very angry mob. I was the first one up. So I sort of gave a spill about what was going on. And I said, yes, BSI is, de is definitely putting things in the river that we need to, to concern ourselves with. But that's only part of the problem. The rest of the problem is all of the agriculture. You can't see it here, but these two shots, this, shot, this is showing a lot of uh, shipyard right here. They actually have dug a canal from their slaughterhouse directly to the river. So when they wash out their slaughterhouse, everything goes right to the river. It's pretty handy for them, but it sucks for the rest of us. Um, this is a shot here. This white area right here is Orange Walk. So I was telling people that when you can walk down the street and you can smell septic smells, that means that sewage is running into the river. It's not going into a treatment system. There is no treatment system there. People said, yes, but we have septic tanks. I said, yes, but how many of those septic tanks actually have bottoms in them? And septic tanks only work if, they're, if they have filter systems on the end. They need bioremediation. They need, they need to stop all of the discharge coming from Orange Walk as we clean up the rest of the system. And we also have to do a lot of work in, um, in shipyards. So that's where the emphasis is being placed right now. Uh, DOE has been also canvassing these areas, identifying the point sources. But when you get down to the uh, Mennonite communities, what you're going to find is hardly any riparian forest left. They, the tractor goes as far into the wetlands as they can before it starts to bog down, and then that's where they back up. But they clear farther than that to guarantee they don't shade their crops and consequently suffer the impacts. Okay, well, here's, the, here's where the news is here. You can't actually see this one. This is pretty good. Restoration and agroforestry projects. These aren't happening in Belize right now, but they're on the verge of happening. This is the first time I've ever seen this situation, and I think this is in response to people realizing where we are right now. We've got six major projects, and all of these are all of these projects are multi-million dollar projects. Six projects that are lined up in Belize to address the watershed issues, deforestation issues. These are all of these projects are about landscape restoration. Because in Belize we've turned a corner here. We can no longer just concern ourselves with protecting the beauty of Belize. Now we have to rebuild things we've torn down. We've got to invest in putting a lot of it back. And so a lot of the money in Mar to R, Mar to R came out of the, uh, a marine project about 15 years ago, I think it was. And they invested a lot of money in marine conservation, but then they began to realize that if we're going to really uh, try to arrest uh, issues in the marine environment, we've got to stop the bleeding from the watersheds. We've got to go upstream. And that's where this project came from, this Mar to R. It should have come online 10 years ago, but there were some money issues and other things that kept it uh, on the back burner for a long time. Red Plus, they've been here for a few years. They've gone through, they're finishing up the second phase. The third phase is actually going to be boots on the ground, 
restoration activities. Um, the IUCN, the same thing. They've been mapping out the issue. They've helped to create the, the Rome map, which is uh, I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, and now they're beginning to strategize where they're going to invest their monies, how they're going to make a contribution to landscape restoration. The World Wildlife Federation teamed up with the Coca-Cola company, and Coca-Cola is very much uh, dedicated to um, helping to improve the watersheds that feed their plants throughout the world. And of course, the Belize River feeds the Coca-Cola plant uh, in, in Belize. And so they're investing, they've teamed up with World Wildlife. Uh, we, the first phase was to create a draft management plan, but a management plan that's not socialized with the, with the stakeholders is not a management plan yet, it's just a draft. So the next phase is to really socialize, to get people involved in putting their, um, put it, giving us their input into how this plan would really go into effect. Because if the people aren't behind the plan, the plan's not going to do anything. So you gotta engage the people. But also part of this money is for riparian restoration. Um, same thing with the UNDP GF6. Um, they're creating a master water plan, which is a lot different than a watershed management plan. They're looking at, at minimum flow standards, for example. We've got a lot of farmers, a lot of tourist facilities, a lot of homeowners putting their pump lines into the Belize River to feed their facilities, one after the other. Every time I float this river, I see new pumps, and these aren't, these aren't small pumps. There's no plan, there's no, there, there is a, uh, an irrigation unit in agriculture, but it really doesn't oversee this issue, which is what it really should be doing. You can only take so much water out of the river before you start causing severe ecological damage. That is a farmer's first instinct as an adaptation to climate change. But every farmer has that same idea and you see where the problem goes. And now there is the um, World Resource Institute teaming up with Katia out of Costa Rica. This is actually a project that I am currently working on right now. Um, I'm doing some of the groundwork and uh, they are focused on direct uh, restoration of degraded landscapes. They're kind of focused more in the coastal areas, but I'm going to get them moving at least up into the lower reaches of the, <coughs> excuse me, up into the lower reaches of the river because it really is all connected and uh, I think that'll be an easy sell. Now the point to all this, this is a lot of money that's going to hit the ground. Uh, some of this we're sharing with other countries um, this last one here, for example, that's a, that's a Belize, Guatemala, and Honduran project, but we get a chunk of that. Um, but what this, what this really equates to is putting trees back into the environment in a, in a way that makes sense. And there are a lot of strategies there. We're going to have to have some expertise to help us figure this out. But we also have to have trees. And those trees aren't going to be imported, they're going to be grown here. I've actually worked on the last three of these projects. And in every one of these projects, I weave in the idea that if we're going to grow trees, we should do it in multiple ways. We should, one, we should put some um, tree nurseries in schools and maybe have a central nursery at maybe UB Central Farm, the agricultural school. But there's also there's room in here for the the entrepreneur that wants to become a nursery manager and grow trees for projects. Um, there's also a need, if you're going to grow trees, you got to have seeds. And you got to have seeds of the right kinds of species of trees you need for restoration. In a riparian setting, when you're right there on the water's edge, there's only a handful of species that will take that kind of energy and survive. But as you move up slope, you can get a lot more creative. The farmer landowner can actually have a, a say-so in the kinds of trees that begin to build that riparian edge and create what we call a working forest. It has um, trees that benefit the farmer in various ways. Uh, so there's, there's those list of trees, and right now I think we have something like maybe 150 
wetland riparian tree species in Belize. Uh, but out of those trees, uh, we're going to need seeds. So there's an opportunity for everybody who, has, who knows about this tree or that tree to be on site during, uh, tree during le uh, seed fall and collect those seeds and sell them to the project for uh, so much per pound. So there's a, an income generation capacity there. And those trees, those seeds eventually then go to the, the, uh, the growers. And those growers are going to be selling those trees to the project. So ultimately the project's going to be buying the trees it needs to implement um, the, the uh, restoration on the ground. We're going to have to have teams of people planting trees. And many of those people, they have to be paid. There will be a lot of volunteers. We're going to reach into the school systems. We want kids putting trees in the ground. Because as, as Chris pointed out, or somebody pointed out earlier today, when a kid plants a tree, they're going to want to show that tree to their kids in 30 years. And that tree, if that kid puts the tree in the ground, likely that, kid, that tree is going to survive because kid's going to keep an eye on that tree. There's a personal relationship, and that's what we want. We want to develop that. So there's a, there, sh there, sh there is and should be a variety of ways that people can actually uh, increase their livelihood, income, uh, through this project while restoring the landscape, which of course is going to ben benefit everybody. Uh, so anyway, this, most of this activity, as I say, is right now on the, in the planning phase. There's no tree, there's, the first tree hasn't been planted yet from any of these projects. But the, the, within, within, I would say within a year to a year and a half, we're going to see some major restoration efforts going on in this country. And that's going to be a cool thing to be involved in, uh, including um, mangrove restoration, which of course is very important. And so here's some other initiatives. <clears throat> the Ministry of Natural Resources is leading this thing called uh, land degradation neutrality for Belize. In other words, if they want to be sure that if deforestation does continue, then there's at least replacement, which I don't, I don't see that as being the best scenario, but they're trying to at least um, put a mark in the sand here. And uh, then the, the, uh, the National Climate Change Office and CATIA are developing a policy for agroforestry. And we were talking about agroforestry today. That's a blend of forestry and agriculture. And there's a lot of very creative ways that can happen. We're talking about not just recovering the landscape, but we're also talking about food sources here. We're also talking about timber and other things that we can, we can uh, bring to the, to the table with, with agroforestry. So there's a, there's a lot of things here, but there's no policy to guide that. It's not something that, forest, that the uh, forest department really takes ownership in, because as, I forget who it was, maybe it was Chris that pointed out that that's, they look at that as an agricultural project. But agriculture doesn't take hold of it because they said, well, this is really a forest project. It reminds me of mangroves in the old days. They threw that ball back and forth too. But uh, finally forestry stepped up and took control of mangroves. And I think forestry is going to probably take control of agroforestry too, but they're going to drag uh, agriculture into this thing uh, as well because agriculture has a vested interest here. And agroforestry needs to become a tool in every farmer's toolkit because they've got lands they can't produce on that they need to recover. And why not recover it not just with the, the, uh, uh, the local set of trees, but you can begin to add a few trees have had, that have economic importance as well. So I think that eventually it will catch on. And then also what's happened too is the uh, IUCN has funded this Restoration Opportunities Assessment Methodology. It's actually a mapping process for the entire country. So they looked at the entire country and they have a, a few types of uh, decision-making uh, criteria they use to decide where the best place is for the most likely success and the highest need to do restoration. And as it turns out, the northern part of Belize is the most heavily impacted of the areas of Belize. The southern part of the Belize is the least impacted. And of course, in the central part, we have those issues I was showing on the board there. 
But ultimately, through this process, we're going to be able to identify where we need to put the energy. And I'm going to be meeting with folks in the, uh, in the ministry to propose the idea that in this phase we're in right now, all these six big players, it's now time for them to come sit down at the round table and have a discussion. Figure out where they're going to combine their, their resources, where they're going to collaborate on how they're going to address this rather large scale issue. And uh, if they do that, they're all going to have more success in their projects than they will if they're working independently. And so that's the next big major step. So ultimately, we see situations like this. <clears throat> this is the Belize River going through agricultural lands. And you do see a row, and I do say a row of trees over here. They're not very thick. That's uh, maybe, maybe close to 66 feet, but you can still see through it as you're floating down the river, and that's my gauge. If I can see through the trees, that's not thick enough. And on this side, are, you have a few scattered trees, but the rest of this is all spiny bamboo. And you can't see it here. <clears throat> this is a, a wetland area, and uh, it's been completely denuded, again, so that tractor doesn't have to turn around. So ultimately, what we want to do and when I show this to farmers, I can hear them shriek in their chairs. We want to create something like that. Put back the riparian forest. Put back the filter system. But while we're reforesting, while we're reforesting, we also have to closely dialogue with the farmers. Because remember, the farmers are the, are the reason we can do what we do. We have to make sure our farmers are successful. Farmers have a lot of issues to deal with. They shouldn't have to solve all those issues. They should have a way to bring those issues to the table. It's our responsibility to help them resolve those issues. If they've got pest problems, if they've got soil problems, if they've got other issues, we have to help them struggle with that. It's not up to them. They're just trying to grow food, and we need to help them with all the other issues. And so it has to be a very collaborative process. We have to listen to what the farmers are telling us. And we have to act on that. We have to improve their conditions so that they don't go to the bank broke from the last year and try to borrow again to try again and get further into debt. Because if farmers fail, so do we. So even though we're trying to um, recover the landscape, we also at the same time want to improve productivity, efficiency, and that's why this last project I think is so important because it brings Cartier into the mix. Anybody in here familiar with Cartier? It's, it's a really great organization. It's only, it, it's, a, it's actually started by the USAID back in the mid 40s in Costa Rica, uh, Terry Alba, Costa Rica. And it has two main focuses. It has agriculture and natural resource management, but they're not separate towers, they're blended. There's many different specialties you can, you can get into within Cartier as a master or doctoral student. But whichever direction you go, you're gonna get a dose of both conservation and agriculture. And you're gonna come out of there thinking about both of those situations together. And, you're, and Cartier, they've been in business long enough that they've actually resolved most of their challenges. I don't think they use pesticides. The last time I was there, they were struggling. The last pesticide they were struggling with was uh, um, fungicides they were using in the bananas. But I think they figured that one out now. So they don't use pesticides. They produce no waste. Everything they produce is composted and biogassed and recycled into their system. It doesn't leave the property. It continually feeds the fields. And they continually produce. And they actually produce high quality finished products that they sell abroad to supplement their, their keep. And it turns out that um, uh, Dr. Um, Mohammed Ibrahim, some of you probably know um, Dr. Mo Dr. Mohammed, he is, he's been working with Katye for a number of years, but he has this kind of 
special soft spot in his heart for Belize. He was down here for quite a few years. Um, when Catier was going a little bit uh, into, the, uh, into the red, he left and went with uh, Aika for a while. But then when Catier started coming back online, they actually hired him to be the heffy. So now he's at the top of the heap and he's really wanting to look after Belize. I think he has a retirement fetish or something for Belize. But anyway, uh, we got a lot of friends in Catier and Catier knows how to raise crops in tropical environments with far more insect pests than we're dealing with here because they're further south and do so successfully without pesticides, without generating waste, and creating a lot of their own energy that drives their systems. So we can learn a lot from Catier. As a matter of fact, a lot of our Belizeans have gone to Catier and come back with advanced degrees and are working here. And I'm hoping that when they come here and get started, they're going to want to engage their, their students. I'm hoping that a lot of them are going to be Belizean students. So I think we got a lot to, uh, um, to learn from Catier. So agriculture is the primary driver of deforestation, loss of climate resilience. But also agriculture can be one of the primary solutions for both short and long-term um, recovery. Uh, that, they're the ones that know how to grow crops, whether it's corn or whether it's trees. We need agriculture involved here. We need agricultural experts to help us out of the situation that we're in. Um, so oftentimes we blame agriculture, but at the same time, agriculture has so much to bring to the table. And it's time that we begin to work together. So how do we move forward? For one, we have to communicate. As I said, we have to listen to the farmers. We have to go to the farmers. They're not going to come to us. They're busy. We got to go to them. And we can't go to them when they're planting and plowing. And we can't go to them when they're harvesting. We have to go to them when it's convenient for them so that they can talk without a lot of other things on their minds. But we also have to reach out to all the other community members in a watershed. Because ultimately, a watershed is the smallest unit of landscape management if you're going to manage a landscape effectively. And all the stakeholders have to be engaged because it's their home. And without their cooperation, things aren't going to get done. Business as usual, dump your garbage into the river. Um, so we got to engage everybody. We got to engage the managers, NGOs, government, and scientists. Everybody has to talk the, talk the language. We have to listen and we have to talk and we have to share information. Um, we have to better understand each other, respect each other's differences, and recognize our shared needs and, in order to move forward, our shared aspirations, what our dreams are, because we have a lot in common. And we have to support each other. We have to work together to build resilience, and we don't have that much time left to do that. So we have to be very efficient with our, with our efforts here. And, and we have to protect and, re, uh, and revive our water and our soil through climate smart agriculture, landscape restoration, and, and just personal commitment. So we, we've got a long way to go. But as I say, this, this last dry season uh, was a very eye-opening event. And for the first time ever, I'm talking to a lot of people who want to talk about what's going on. When we were facing the crowd in Orange Walk, the room was full of anger. And I appreciated that because that's response. At least people are angry enough, they're concerned enough to be angry. Now we can work with that. We can turn that anger into something positive, but at least we get a response. Sometimes a project spends half as money just trying to get people involved. We've got engaged people right now. The, the new, there was a, um, the sixth um, biodiversity um, national report was just released from Belize, and it's got some very interesting maps in there. It's got a map, for example, of all of the school systems throughout the country that have environmental clubs, and they were all over there. It's got a map in there of all the community organizations that are formed to address their local issues. And many of these organizations, organizations aren't even registered, don't even have any funding, they're doing it on their own. And there were a lot of them. That tells me right there, there's a growing groundswell of people 
who want to do something. And our job is to help them figure out what that is and help build their capacity to do that. And that's where I want to see most of this project on board. So we've got the funding, we're getting the expertise. We already have the expertise among us. Uh, we have a, a generation of Belizeans returning from advanced degrees all over the world that can bring those talents to bear right here in Belize. And I think that we have a better chance right now than most people do. We just have to get started now. Big job, but we got to get started now. Thank you.